come in. So I'm happy to introduce Ryan Park of Pinterest. Uh, prior to joining Pinterest, he was the head of operations at PBWorks, uh, and now, of course, working with Pinterest, which has absolutely exploded in size. Uh, one of the, the most explosive growths, I think, uh, using Amazon EC2. So uh, without further ado, Ryan Park. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Park, and I've been leading operations at Pinterest for about a year or so. Um, like you mentioned, the company is just the growth of the site and the growth of the company has just been uh, tremendous. There were eight people there a year ago when I started, and there's something like 80 people there now. So it's just uh, been phenomenal. But we've um, been using Puppet that whole time and uh, have a number of things that we'd like to share about some of the lessons we've learned and everything about uh, how to use Puppet. So just a little bit of background. Uh, Pinterest is a virtual pin board, a place to collect all of the things that inspire you on the web. And you can organize pins into boards categorized by topics that you choose, and then follow people that you know or follow boards that share your interest and your taste. And the end, re uh, end result is that Pinterest becomes like a personalized catalog uh, showing content that directly interests and inspires you. Uh, companies like Williams Sonoma are using Pinterest to promote their brands and their products. And even President Obama's re-election campaign has a Pinterest account. So a little bit about Pinterest's technical architecture. Uh, our main code base is a Python web application. And it started as a Django application, but we've moved away from a number of, of the Django pieces over time as our needs have grown and become kind of specialized. Uh, so we've moved instead to a more service-oriented architecture. And so we have a number of internal web services or thrift services that uh, communicate then with back-end data stores like MySQL and Redis, uh, the, uh, an in-memory database, and Memcache. And of course, for uh, performance reasons, the web application itself also talks to Memcache directly a lot. Uh, now, all of our servers are virtual EC, uh, instances on Amazon EC2 platform. So we don't run any physical hardware. Uh, it's all entirely in Amazon's cloud. And uh, that's worked well for us and had some really interesting, uh, interesting benefits and interesting challenges, uh, especially when working with Puppet that we'll go into a little bit later in the, in the speech. So before Puppet, um, we would basically use Amazon's uh, Amazon machine images, or, or their snapshots, basically, to configure machines. So we'd build up what seems like a perfectly good database server and decide sort of from gut feel that it felt OK and make an image of it, and then launch a copy of that image the next time we needed another database server or something. And that worked OK, but the, there never was any real way to validate that these database servers were correct. And when we launched, new, once we had a bunch of servers up, there was no way to run uh, code against, uh, against a lot of them or, or make changes to them. And so for example, um, when, the, uh, uh, when the early employees launched a new database server, in order to change the host name that appears in the prompt, they would just go and edit the bash profile and change that host name right there in the, in the bash script rather than actually setting the host name on the server or something. And obviously, like, there were just a lot of little things like that that meant that every server became kind of a unique snowflake and, and was difficult to manage. And we had no real list of what was running in our architecture. So we'd actually have to look at the known hosts file, see what servers people have SSH to over the last few um, weeks or over the last few months, and hope that that was a somewhat authoritative list of what servers we had. So when I got to Pinterest and, and was sort of the first person dealing with technical operations as my main focus, um, bringing in Puppet uh, and bringing in Puppet Dashboard were really critical to, uh, to the work that we did in sort of standardizing everything. So Puppet Dashboard is a web application. It's an open source product from Puppet Labs. And it lets you define all of your servers and what Puppet classes should be installed on those servers. So we use this data as the source of truth about what's running in our environment. All of our EC2 instances are listed in Puppet Dashboard. And so if we need to know what servers are running and what, uh, how they're supposed to be configured, this is the place we go to. Uh, there are a number of other uh, external node classifiers that we thought about using. Um, the most basic option is not to use an, an ENC at all and just put your nodes in the Puppet manifest. But that limits the utility of this data just to Puppet itself. You can't really interact then with that data in other systems. Uh, we looked at using LDAP and Foreman, and, and uh, both of those tools uh, may be good in certain environments, but in our case, the dashboard really um, was the right choice for us. So this is a screenshot of the, of the dashboard, and that um, blurry stuff in the center is a list of servers that, that we have running right now. Um, and so the dashboard ultimately is a web interface listing all the servers in your environment. And on the left, in the upper left, there's a summary of 
the nodes that, uh, of all the nodes in their current state. And in the lower left is uh, a list of groups, of, of node groups. And that's, for us, one of the most useful parts of the dashboard. This is how we bundle hosts into groups that represent logical services. And so we apply configurations. We apply uh, puppet classes and things to the groups and then assign hosts into those groups. So here's an example of a group for one of our internal services called the data layer. And the specifics of that aren't, aren't uh, super important, but you can see that groups contain a list of the puppet classes that should be installed on each of the servers there. And they uh, also contain a list of parameters up at the top, uh, which, is, which are just other ways of passing data into Puppet when it runs. Um, and groups can contain other groups, like an inheritance tree. So you see that this group, uh, this data layer group, contains uh, the, or is derived from the, the prod group, which is how all of our production servers are supposed to be run. And so that way, these servers get things like syslog and postfix. They inherit those from prod, but then um, get sp uh, other classes and other parameters that come in specifically for this kind of service. So one problem we've had with the Puppet dashboard is that the number of Puppet classes um, listed here becomes unmanageable after a while. And not only are there classes listed here, but there also, of course, are classes being included by your Puppet manifest. So if you have an include statement or, a, um, or uh, if you inherit from another class, then you suddenly have some of this dependency information listed in uh, the Puppet manifest, and you have other dependency information listed in the Puppet dashboard. And we found that just gets really confusing for people to understand what's being installed on a server and why. So we've moved to a uh, slightly different approach where we're trying to define more of these kind of dependencies of the physical classes in the Puppet manifests and less about the physical classes in the Puppet dashboard. Um, the dashboard is still a good way to sort of provide that entry point into Puppet and, and get, give Puppet a starting off point of, of what should be installed. But hopefully, that dependency graph, by putting it all in the manifest, it makes it easier for engineers that are writing Puppet uh, manifests to understand what's being installed on, on a server and why. So we make heavy use of the node groups feature. It's how we logically organize the hosts in our environment um, by the services they provide. And we use these node groups to inform other systems of how the services are configured. So for example, uh, we have a central monitoring system that needs to know what servers are live in our web app pool right now. And so the node groups are a good way to identify what those servers are. And we get a lot more power from this data by joining the Puppet dashboard's node group data with the Puppet store conf uh, configs data. Now, both of these uh, can use MySQL as a backing store for both of those kind of systems. So we uh, have them both in the same MySQL database, and we can literally join that data together then to report on both the logical way that servers should be configured and sort of the physical properties of what the facts are and how the servers actually are configured. We built a REST API to interact with the data in the Puppet dashboard and the stored configs. And the API's output is JSON, which means that it's easy for both people and software to understand. The source code to this API is in the code samples that we have up on, on GitHub, uh, which is at github.com slash Pinterest if you're interested in following along. So one caveat to this is that we wrote this in Python because that's the language that, that we know and understand best. And it makes a lot of assumptions about our server's architecture and exactly how our environment looks. Um, but hopefully you can take a look at the source if you're interested and get some ideas about what might work for you. Um, and perhaps it will work directly as is uh, for some of you. Now, Puppet Labs recently released Puppet DB, which is another open source product that also has a REST API for interacting with that stored configs data. Now, this may be more useful to some of you because it's a lot more generic and, and uh, should apply to most any Puppet environment. But we've found that one really useful thing of tying this both to the dashboard and the stored configs together is that it allows us to get that sort of combination logical and physical view. And the Puppet DB is much more of an interface for the physical data, like from your, from your stored configs or from the uh, last catalog run or something. And one important concept here is that this, um, this data sort of becomes self-documenting. Because if you go to this entry point of what the, this, this uh, slash API on the, on the server that's running it, it'll give you links to everything else. And, ev and all the resources that we mention in the API include links to get to those resources as well. So we can give an engineer this entry point and say, go have at it and figure out what you need. And they're, they're usually able to, um, with just some basic understanding of, what, of how Puppet works, they're able to then find the, the information that they need from that. 
So let's look at some examples of the data that we serve from the API. Uh, this is, uh, is a list of all the node groups we have defined in Puppet Dashboard. And this list itself is pretty basic. It's just a set of names of the groups and URLs to get more uh, detailed data about what's in that group. And now let's look at how we represent one of those groups in the API. Um, this is a group that we've defined in our Puppet Dashboard called Follower Redis. It's a specific kind of uh, cluster of Redis database servers. So the group uh, is derived from that the a sort of more basic Redis group. And uh, Puppet will install Redis on this and then configure Redis based on the, special, the specific parameters we have defined up there. So let's look at how this group is represented in the API and then what that allows us to do as we integrate this with other systems. Uh, this is the structure for the JSON of, uh, of what, the, what a group looks like. It has a list of the nodes, a list of the classes that are on the nodes, and, and so on. Uh, so the nodes generally, again, are mostly give the, a name and a URL to find more data about the specific nodes. So you can see all the nodes then that are in this group. Uh, you can see what classes are installed on the group. Uh, you can see the parameters that we've set for the group. Basically, the, the very similar kinds of data to what was in the, uh, what's in the Puppet Dashboard UI, but of course, programmatically available to, uh, to software. And now let's look at how a node is represented in the API. Um, I should mention that, that the data that we have, uh, that we're showing off here has been sanitized a bit. Um, it's not quite how things look in our production environment. So if you were thinking about breaking into our servers on, from this, it uh, might be a little bit different than, than how it is there. But um, the data format is how it, how it is in production. And this is very similar in that it, again, lists the node groups and classes and things that um, belong to the, the, that, this, that are installed on this particular node. So you can see what groups this node belongs to, uh, belongs to and what classes have been installed on the node. And you can also get the fact data, the same kind of thing that you'd see in Factor if you were running it from the command line. Um, this allows us to see things like the, the IP address and the operating system and a, a lot of different facts about EC2 that get published by Factor and, and things like that. And once we have this kind of data programmatically um, tied together with the structure of how our cluster is supposed to look, it uh, lets us start using this data in other systems besides Puppet. So here's an example client that we wrote that just generates an Etsy hosts file through this API. And the Python script is really only about a dozen lines of code or so, but it's able then to pull all that data out of uh, the API, out of the Puppet dashboard and stored configs database, and generate a, a simple Etsy hosts file like this. And once you have the ability to do that in just a, a dozen lines of code, um, it means that we can use that data to configure a lot of other systems. So in addition to the Etsy host file, uh, we generate configuration files for Monit, our monitoring system, uh, which allows us to uh, just make sure all the servers are up and responding on the, on the ports that each group is supposed to be responding on. Uh, we can take the server's host names and push those into Amazon's Route 53 DNS service, which is what we use for, for internal and external DNS. Uh, we also can use this to keep the list of, of known hosts, the list of certificates in the uh, Puppet Master clean. And we can find any servers that might have been deleted from the dashboard and delete them automatically from the Puppet Master so that then if we launch a, a replacement for that box with the same name or something, we don't have, to, we don't have a certificate conflict or something. Um, we also integrate our other operational tools directly with the data in the Puppet dashboard. So these kinds of systems uh, query the Puppet API to determine what hosts to deploy new code to or which hosts to display on our monitoring and metrics dashboards. And having all of that available from one source of truth that's tied both to how the servers are configured and how, um, and, and how the servers physically look, again, enables us to make sure that we always are deploying to the, the the immediately correct set of hosts or something like that. Uh, so now I'd like to move on and discuss how we're using Puppet uh, in the Amazon EC2 environment. And let's start by talking about how we bootstrap EC2 instances, how we launch them and, and run Puppet on them. So we have one AMI now for all of our instances, much better than when we had a different AMI for each kind of service or something. And it's really just a basic Ubuntu AMI with these three packages installed on it. Uh, with these three packages together, then, we can, uh, that's really all we need that, uh, to run Puppet the first time the instance launches. So we actually do cheat a bit because there, it would take like 20 minutes to bring up an instance if we started with a purely basic uh, 
uh, AMI. So we do install about 60 Debian packages and about 60 Python packages when we, uh, ma when we create this AMI. And the uh, one thing that we, that we uh, do keep in mind there is that everything that we pre-install, we also make sure is listed in our Puppet manifest, or else it would be really hard to, um, that way Puppet can basically ensure that it's, uh, that the server looks like it's supposed to, even if someone has gone in and, and maybe ac accidentally or intentionally changed something later. So when launching EC2 instances, um, the good news is they let you specify a name for each instance. The bad news is that name is not actually correspond to the host name or anything useful on the instance itself. Um, and we do use those names as a way to keep track of what our instances are doing. Um, our, logical, our, our names for our servers are like app001 or app002, things like that. Um, but the host names always get set to something ugly like this. So we um, actually use the RC local script to query for the host name, the name uh, that we, uh, excuse me, we query the EC2 tags to get the name, and then we set the, uh, the host name based on that tag. So just an example of, of the code that we use for this. Um, it actually can't be done directly from the instance without some credentials. So we've set up um, Amazon, uh, has an uh, authentication feature called IAM, and we've set up separate IAM credentials that just allow it to get these tags. And once we have the um, credentials on there to get the tags, we can run through these two commands and get the, ta get the name tag for this server. And uh, this just pulls it into a, a, a local variable, a bash variable called instance name. And then we can use that variable to set the server's host name. So uh, going through all this, the uh, code at the top will get the ho server's host name set correctly, which then means when it identifies itself to Puppet, it uses a logical name that, we've, um, that we can define in the Puppet dashboard to uh, ensure that, the, that uh, the server comes up with a name that actually makes sense to us. And once we've run through those, those, uh, two, those two basic steps, then we can just run Puppet once, and uh, it'll, uh, it'll uh, connect to our Puppet master and uh, work correctly. So I'd also like to talk about how we use um, Amazon EC2's auto-scaling features. Now, when I made this slide, we uh, were running about 80 servers for our main web application. And we need this much capacity to handle our afternoon and evening peak traffic, but there's a lot of wasted capacity late at night when traffic is much lower. So normally, you'd have all of your servers running 24 hours a day, as shown here. But we recently implemented auto-scaling so that we can bring up uh, more servers in the afternoon and evening and shut down servers that we don't need late at night. And by using auto-scaling, we've cut the number of servers we're running on average by about 40%. And since we're paying for EC2 servers by the hour, we've tied our cost structure much more directly to the amount of traffic we're actually supporting throughout the day. So one issue with this is that Puppet Dashboard, at, when, you use, when you use Puppet Dashboard as the external node classifier, Puppet Dashboard um, needs to know about each server in advance in order to know what, um, what to install on that server. And so normally, you'd, when you set up a server, you'd go into Puppet Dashboard in the web interface and add the server and, and configure it right there in the web interface. Um, but that doesn't work so well when you're launching uh, dozens of new instances uh, every day, automatically every day, especially when you're doing it in the middle of the night when you really don't want to be sitting there. Uh, so we have created another endpoint for our API that allows us to, um, when we bring up a new server, uh, get a host name for that server and uh, basically inform Puppet Dashboard that it should be watching out, that, that here's a new server it needs to know about. So if we send a post request to this slash API slash provision endpoint, then it will uh, add a node to the dashboard database and return the host name. So with the auto scaling, you don't know host names in advance. You don't know that this one's going to be app 080 or 081 or something. Um, you just may know that it's going to be in the app group. So if we know it's in the app group, then we can, can basically ask the Puppet dashboard to create a new host in that app group and give us back a name that's going to be the name for that host. And it would return something like app81 or data layer 005. And uh, once it returns that, then we know that, that um, we should use this name. And when we connect to Puppet as this, with this host name, that the dashboard will, uh, uh, will provide us with the right configuration for, that, for the group because it's been uh, provisioned uh, in the dashboard through, through this post command. 
And uh, one nice thing is that this endpoint, we actually um, are just returning as a string, not as, as JSON. But the benefit for that is that then we can use it directly in that RC local script um, instead of just setting the host name from the, um, from the EC2 tag. So this is the code that we use to set the host name if there isn't a host name in the EC2 tag, if it's coming up from the autoscaling. And it just pulls in the uh, node group name from a file that, uh, that's a, an EC2 specific thing called user data, which is just a, another way to pass data into an instance. You can pass in a, a, a big long chunk of XML or JSON, or you can pass in just a, a single little uh, string or variable. And so we pass in in the user data the name of the group that the, that the node's supposed to be in. And then the node itself will go out and say, hey, I'm a new app server. I'm a new data layer server. Uh, uh, it'll ask the dashboard's API to give me a real name for, my, for myself, for the, give the server a name for itself, and then it will um, uh, continue on with, with running the rest of the Puppet run. So now that we've got Puppet and Puppet dashboard in place, we have a single source of truth uh, that's easily accessible both by humans and by uh, other software. And we really make use of the medium that we've, uh, that we've got here. We've taken advantage of a lot of the uh, Puppet's features and EC2's features together to really plug them into each other and, and make the best use we can of both of those systems. So if you're interested in uh, Puppet, obviously, or uh, Amazon EC2, we'd love to hear from you. We uh, are definitely looking for, we'd love to like double the size of our operations team at the moment. So uh, feel free to uh, uh, drop us a note down, uh, at the uh, URL down there or uh, talk to me. Cool, so I can uh, take any questions if anybody has questions. Uh, yeah, can you, or I can repeat it or you can go up to the mic. Okay. How do you handle the uh, certificate signing when you're auto scaling? Yeah, so we use auto signing for everything. Um, we uh, obviously have the uh, the Puppet server and all of our servers set up in EC2 and security groups such that the only thing they can actually talk to Puppet are our own hosts, and we feel that that provides us enough uh, security that um, that we're comfortable using the auto signing. Uh, but because we reuse host names between uh, e each day, that, that we may launch 80 app servers today and then shrink that down to 40, but when we, when we bring it back up again tomorrow, we don't, wanna, um, we don't wanna start with 81 up through 120 or so have it grow forever. So that's why we have to clean out those um, old certificates from the Puppet Master before we uh, launch the next day. Yeah, yeah, the question was about how we, um, uh, what we classify in the dashboard versus in the manifest. And so, yeah, the examples I've shown here um, were a couple of classes that we set up uh, a few months back. But what we've, the pattern we've been trying to use instead is to, ha to have like a MySQL server class in the dashboard. And so there might be a MySQL server group, and the only thing that group really installs is MySQL server class. And then that class we use to um, configure exactly what should be on those MySQL servers. Or, and to some extent, there, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between um, server roles and, and the classes that they install at this point. So rather than, um, rather than having uh, a bunch of different classes that that role or that group is going to install on the server, we try and keep that to one class in, in Puppet and then let pu Puppet, through its dependency resolution process, um, install all the other classes that are needed. Yep. Yeah, yeah, the question is, um, do we use EC2 spot instances, and do we find that it's cheaper to use reserved instances than to autoscale or vice versa? So first of all, yeah, we do use spot instances. Um, actually, uh, we use a combination of reserved instances, uh, these standard on-demand instances, and spot instances when we're, um, uh, as we are uh, uh, launching these, these autoscale uh, clusters. So let me try and go back. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, in this example, we have, uh, for these kind of systems, we uh, have kind of a base level of reserved instances that we pre-purchase from Amazon. And basically, the way those work is that if you, you make a larger upfront payment, uh, and then the hourly cost is much less. So we might have, like in this example, like 20 servers that are um, that we know are running 24 hours a day, and so that we're going to uh, pre-purchase as reserved instances. And then we supplement that with both uh, the standard on-demand instances and the spot instances. And the deal with the spot instances is that rather than it being a fixed price set by Amazon, um, it's much more of a market price that they set based on uh, how much demand there is right now. Uh, the, at the moment, the spot instances are like 90% cheaper than the standard instances. They're, they're just ridiculously uh, cheap in comparison. The, uh, we use the high CPU instances for these, and the standard instances right now are like 66 cents an hour, and the spot instances are 7 cents an hour. So it makes a lot of sense to bring in those spot instances when we can. So we, uh, if we have this sort of basic level of reserved instances that we've prepaid for, then the rest of that we supplement um, about 50% sort of the standard reserved in, uh, the standard on demand instances and 50% the spot instances. And the reason you want to sort of limit that spot instance uh, those spot instances somewhat is that spot instances can get shut down at any time and the price can fluctuate. And so whereas the standard on demand instances you're guaranteed a little bit um, higher quality of service. But we have uh, our own auto scaling scripts that will sort of balance those and, and try and keep it to a certain level of standard and a certain level of spot, but we'll supplement that if the spot instances aren't available or anything. Yep. Any other questions? Or? Yeah, the question is about uh, VPC, which is Amazon's virtual private cloud, which is a way of sort of segmenting your own servers into um, into a more of a, of a private area of Amazon's cloud. Um, we're not currently using that, but we are uh, definitely moving to it. Uh, one of the, uh, we've, it's, it's very difficult to move a running system to VPC, especially when you have hundreds of different servers running dozens of different roles. Uh, so I would definitely recommend if you're just starting out, um, it takes, there's a bit of a learning curve and, uh, to getting started in VPC, but I definitely recommend that you do that in advance. Yeah, um, we expect the puppet design should stay the same in VPC. Um, we, uh, yeah, we don't expect that there will be that there will be any changes. It's more of a of a change to how the networking layer looks than how the servers themselves are configured. Cool. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, is, is location and, and sort of where our servers live. And, and we currently, all of our servers are in the US East uh, uh, region right now, which is uh, sort of a geographic region, a geographic area. Um, other options would be to put it in US West or in Brazil or Tokyo or all around the world. We currently are all based in, in US East. Um, but within those regions, they give you different availability zones, which are um, sort of the equivalent of, of multiple data, they're like multiple data centers in a region. And the idea being that if they have a power outage or some kind of major uh, uh, catastrophe of some sort, it may it affect one availability zone, but it generally shouldn't affect more than one in the same region. And so we do have our servers split across all the availability zones. And we find the latency between those, uh, those zones or those data centers is pretty small. It's like one millisecond or less. So we um, do split our servers across the uh, different availability zones, but um, and we just try and keep it so that things are balanced, so that if we're running a database master and a slave, they're in different zones, or if we're running a, uh, um, a, a web server farm, it might be split between two or three different zones. Uh, but that said, it's pretty easy, because the latencies are small, to have that kind of replication uh, across the, uh, the zones, but it'd be a lot harder if you're trying to replicate between like US East and US West. Uh, the auto scaling, I'm not sure, we have our own custom auto scaling scripts, um, so I'm not sure how Amazon's, I believe Amazon's you would specify, like we want certain number of nodes in this zone and we want a certain number of nodes in that zone. Um, so if you're running, if you're uh, like load balancing uh, a web application or something, you might want 10 nodes in, in each zone or, or something like that. Cool, yep. Uh, Luke? Hello, cool. Um, you said you're using an API to, for example, populate the host file. Um, mm -hmm. Do you do that on the servers, or is that just for like, your laptop? So 
we do that on a couple of servers that need right. specific data. Sure. Um, the problem is, is that because Amazon uses those internal host names for everything, uh, reverse DNS doesn't give you anything useful in Amazon's cloud. It gives you all these, just these that are just basically their, what their IP address is. So for servers that need reverse DNS, which are things like our syslog collector or our um, Ganglia metrics collector, then we populate uh, Etsy host files on those servers. But on everything else, there's no need, of course, to. Uh, sure because they, they should just be able to use normal DNS. I was more curious about how you actually go about telling, for example, uh, an app server where a database server is, and you know, how you tell a load balancer where the, the app server is. Yeah, you, how do you so, so we use just um, standard DNS for that, and then we have, um, right now, it's it just configuration files that, that specify that for this kind of database, you want to talk to uh, DB001 or DB002 or something. Um, for, we're definitely, um, finding that that becomes kind of inflexible as uh, your as the number of servers grow and you have dozens of cache servers or hundreds of, of database servers or something and so uh, we're looking at tools like zookeeper which is a more dynamic way of pushing configuration out to servers um, where they all check in with a with a master a set of master servers and uh, you can and you can push configuration out much more dynamically that way and so that's sort of the direction we're moving to but it um, Hopefully, uh, that, hopefully that'll be finished up this fall. Are you, are you oh, just on, on Zookeeper? Actually, are you custom writing sort of clients for Zookeeper then, or are you how, how are you integrating with Zookeeper? Um, there are clients for Python and, and for things like that. The plan is that it would be that we'd use the Zookeeper client in our in our Python application. Thank you. If anybody has any experience with that, especially with Python, I'd love to chat more because it's definitely uh, um, a little bit tricky, and we found that the Python Zookeeper client uh, is. Uh, because it relies on, it sort of runs in a separate thread. Um, it's a little uh, unusual compared to how a lot of Python stuff works. Cool. So I think that. Oh, yep. One more. Yeah. 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 So. Right. So. The image we have, we, um, we preload like 60 Python packages and 60, uh, 60 Debian packages or so. But all of those are defined in Puppet. So if we need to upgrade, if we need to change a version, or we need to remove one maybe, um, or, or uh, add more, of course, we can do all that through Puppet. So we expect that this box is going to be somewhat pre-configured, but by no means does it have everything that it's going to need for any particular role. Um, and so it always is going to check into Puppet, and when it does, then uh, Puppet can actually, if, it, if it's like ensure latest or ensure a specific version of a package, then um, Puppet would uh, just make sure that, that the newer version gets installed. Cool. Well, I think we're uh, about out of time. Sure. sure. Yeah, the, the question is, are we managing OS patches with Puppet? Um, we are, to, uh, to some extent, I mean, it, uh, it's like we, a lot of our packages we just use Ensure Latest, and then we have our own um, uh, OS repository so that we can control what actually latest really means. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, I'm, uh, I'll be around to answer any more questions if anybody else has questions. Thanks.